Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. There's some water up in here. <laughs> so welcome to the second colloquium of the spring series. And today we are excited and honored to have our fellow Damaris Hill present her work, her new work. And she will be introduced by Tracy K. Smith, who is the professor of English and of African and African American Studies, as well as the Wallach Professor at the Radcliffe Institute, and the author of a new volume of creative writing, <laughs> To Free the Captives. And I'm honored to have an autographed copy. So please welcome Professor Smith. Thank you, Krishna. Um, I am so grateful and delighted to be able to introduce my friend, uh, Damaris Hill, uh, one of the most, not just my friend, but one of the most profound and dynamic historians of the black experience and black women's literature, and one of the most compelling and original poets and creative scholars of her generation. A professor of creative writing, English, and African American studies at the University of Kentucky, Hill's creative genius lies not only in her bold crossings of disciplinary boundaries, but also in the fiercely beautiful language with which she mines history. Speaking of boundaries and history, Hill's work reminds me that history is, by nature, hybrid. There's no surface it doesn't reach, no language it doesn't speak, no scale from which history is not operating upon and within our collective and individual lives. The will to account for this everywhere and everythingness drives the scope and resourcefulness of Hill's intertextual scholarship and poetry, which bears witness to the living, resisting, boundary-defying labor and legacies of black women and girls across time and place. And I'm looking up at Sidia, and I'm like, she's not the only scholar who's doing this <laughs> in this room. So we are, we are extraordinarily blessed. But we get to hear today how this um, emerges from Damaris Hill's unique and singular vision and vocabulary. So not our, only are boundaries in history big, but time and place is a pretty large terrain as well. Uh, one of the gifts of Hill's work is that it fills that space with intimate regard. We are claimed there by the timber of kinship. Her poem, What You Ought to Know About Ida, considers the life of Ida Howard, a black woman known as the Badger Queen at the turn of the 20th century. The tone of this poem rescues Howard from hard times and hard time, drawing her instead into the safety of insular community, extended family. There, she becomes familiar, domestic, conceivable, someone to fear and love, like my strict Aunt Sally, known in the generations of my family to take no mess. Hill writes, Ida don't tolerate no disrespect. One wrong word, she'd slice your neck. Been to Eastern twice as a badger. She used to punch quick learned to cut faster. Her reason and razor all connect. Contrary to the wisdom of crime blotters, Howard's life isn't haphazard. She does what she does out of good sense. Her living obeys a logic. If you find herself, yourself, on the wrong side of her blade, it's because you failed to know better. This poem sits in Hill's first book of poems, A Bound Woman is a Dangerous Thing, The Incarceration of African American Women from Harriet Tubman to Sandra Bland, a willful public genealogy. This volume stands as roll call of activists, artists, and everyday women who have endured captivity from jail time to bondage within social strictures. Quote, it is costly to stay free and appear sane, Hill writes, channeling her own grandmother, Harriet Beecher Spruill Hill, 
whose living and resisting is offered up as an instrument in the ever unfolding enterprise of freedom. Hill's body of work is filled with women and girls who shoulder one another, who lean back into one another's arms, coaching each other and us forward and up. In her lines, this poet is as likely to harmonize with Ida B. Wells as with Whitney Houston, who is herself harmonizing with Aretha Franklin, and so on, in a sonic and social fabric that invites all in. Feminist theorist and, bell, and poet Bell Hooks is there as an intellectual mother, insisting that this honest and arduous sifting and listening be fueled by and filtered through a vocabulary of love. And Hill complies. You will love again. You will love a man who will want to cage you. You will carry this man's son. You will be a girl, a mother, a wonder. You believe wandering is a kind of love. You will spend the rest of your life running. You will become an, abolition, an abolitionist and never stop being a girl. You will, your love will be the greatest power you know. Your love, she will confuse and awe you. You will embrace love with a long-handled spoon. You will pick through love's flesh for fish bones. You tell yourself you will not choke or die for love. You are afraid to believe this. These lines make up one section of the poem, What You Talking About, from Hill's most recent collection, Breath Better Spent, Living Black Girlhood. In it, you are many things simultaneously, among them a teenage girl, your own actual self, a collective history, and the man is many things, too. A boy, a grown man you have no business fooling with, <laughs> and also perhaps a nation. <laughs> and also perhaps a nation that wants something from you, that promises you things, that gets under your skin and into your head. And love is love. The hard, hurting, healing, coaxing, conjuring, save yourself and me too kind. In addition to Breath Better Spent, which has been described as urgent and luminous in a starred Publishers Weekly review, and A Bound Woman is a Dangerous Thing, which, won an Amazon, which was an Amazon number one bestseller in African American poetry, a Publishers Weekly top 10 history title, and the 2020 NAACP Image Award nominee for outstanding literary work in poetry, Hill's other books include The Fluid Boundaries of Suffrage and Jim Crow, Staking Claims in the American Heartland, and Visible Textures. I'll add that Shut Up in My Bones is a digital poem that uses remix, pastiche, and intertextuality to honor Hill's grandmother and the history that we build and share. And as you know, Hill is currently a fellow here at the Hutchins Center. She's also um, held fellowships at the Civitella Ranieri Foundation. Um, she was a visiting faculty fellow at the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity in America at Brown University. She's um, held a fellowship at the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, among her other honors. But I'm excited to hear from her and hear some of her new working and thinking. I know, I know. Trust me, you never want to follow Tracy K. Smith. It's not something you want to do. Tracy, thank you for that introduction. That's all I'm going to say right now. And thank you all for coming and sharing um, this first in-person reading of this draft with me. My memoir, Blood Bible, is an intersectional and relational memoir about me in, in relationship with others. Blood Bible is also a midrash, a deeper telling of what you think you know. This excerpt is punctuated with themes. They include what I pray for, what I understand, and what we collectively know. It is a chapter about my maternal grandmother's family the Walkers, the title of this chapter 
is the walkers and the wheel. When she is four, my mother is taken to the ocean. They put a two by four plank of wood underneath her and tell her to kick and paddle. She closes her wide eyes and begins. Her father removes the board. She is a swimmer. I prayed to know my ancestors. On December 15th, 2023, seven days before the winter solstice, I am collecting oral histories. I am interviewing my mother's aunt, my great aunt Gurley. She is my maternal grandmother's baby sister. She lives in Bermuda. She is the only one of her siblings on this side of heaven. She will tell you it is lonely. She is not one to hold her tongue. Aunt Gurley weighs about 96 pounds and two tons of that weight is candor. <laughs> Six months ago, we buried my mother at a funeral. At the funeral, Aunt Gurley has us erupting in laughter. Truth is disruptive. Histories of empires are bound by moments of intentional forgetting. The former Prime Minister Winston Churchill, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, boasted that history will be kind to him for he intends to write it. Those are his words, and maps are forged in a violent child's fist. They are illustrations of conquest. Imagine England a thousand years ago as a war-ravaged country with Britain slaves before and after this Roman occupation of the island. The dominant culture of the Romans dictate that the slaves become serfs, and over the next hundred years, slaves and serfs and commoners reach some autonomy under the British law, but un un unfree and unpaid work and servitude continue. This English slave comp population is not comprised of Africans. The dominant histories of the English empire are not origin stories. They are a highlights reel. Did you know that the ovum, the human egg, in the wet and dark cavern of the human body resembles the sun? We do not acknowledge the science, this in the scientific world. In the rational world, we ignore the body and wait for external forces to comfort us. We look to the sun for wisdom and the heavens for refuge, but never within. I pray to know my ancestors. Within the Zoom screen, my Aunt Gurley is looking two generations too young. She wears a Tiffany blue sweater and brass buttons. Her narrow face is naked and gorgeous. Her daughter, cousin Siobhan, who is in her mid-50s but looks 30, is standing off to her left. And my Aunt Carolyn, who is near 80 and looks 50, is off to her right. My Aunt Gurley reminds me that she was born in the year 1937. She tells me her mother's name, Jenny Gibbons Walker. Then her father's name, Kingsley Walker. She says that she knows very little about him and even less about his family. She closes this portion of the conversation by explaining how they spent most of their childhood in church. She jokes about how my grandmother was holier than their devout mother, Jenny, too holy to ask for rum-soaked raisins and Christmas cakes. <clears throat> History is in the service of empire and is inadvertently entangled in the practice of intentional forgetting. Probably around Christmas 1100 AD, slavery was nearly outlawed in England. This is true 400 years later when, Eng when the English begin to capture and sell the Pequot, Wampanoag, Narragansett, and other indigenous peoples into slavery all over Europe and the Caribbean, including Bermuda. This is true when the first enslaved Africans come to the American colonies and assume their time in servitude rather than indenture. This is before the law systematically transforms black bodies into cash crops. Did you know the ovum's cargo is DNA? DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid, a polymer, the double helix structure twists and coils around one another, 
coil to look like serpents, the two undersides of a reptile holding the light of a morning star. Under an electron microscope, human beings look more like the devil in Eden than anyone will admit. <laughs> <laughs> DNA is made when external influences are confronted with an internal power source. Maybe desire is electric and housed within a molecule. Life is just not a series of chemical reactions that, are, that results in a person, but a series of ways a person interrupts external forces within the context of her being. I intend to know my ancestors. I pray about it. During my interview with my Aunt Gurley, she tells me that she grew up in Bailey's Bay, Bermuda, where her family had always lived, where her young uncle, Carl Gibbons, played cricket in the yard and a plot of, and played cricket in the yard, a plot of land on top of an underworld of treasure. Bailey's Bay is where my grandmother met my grandfather. They marry at 17, but they meet when she is 12. They are younger than Shakespeare's lovers, Romeo and Juliet. As a boy, my grandpa flips my grandma's waist length braids out of the aisle of rolled pupils, tossing it onto the desk. In the thump of her braid, God whispers to the girl-aged grandmother that the low boy, my boy-aged grandfather, will be her husband. My grandmother is overjoyed. She has found love and salvation all at once. <laughs> this is better than the underworld of treasures that her uncle Carl found, the one that made the papers. The uncle chases a cricket ball down a hole and discovers a cave with 12 foot crystals and a glittering lake. The neighbor lowered his 14 year old son into the hole for confirmation. 150 feet down, they confirm a 30 million year old cavern with crystal formations and a 55 foot cle deep clear lake. A world so beautiful that two movies were staged there and it was visited by Mark Twain. My grandmother knows her uncle Carl's story and that she is due a miracle. My great great uncle never got his ball back. Today he gets a mention on the website. <laughs> and my grandmother's sister, Aunt Gurley, smacks her teeth when she tells me they didn't give those boys nothing. History may forget my kind, but I will not. Long before Churchill, we know that Charles II started the Royal African Company and killed more Africans than he can count, trying to own the world, sacrificing everyone. Charles II would do anything except bear a legitimate royal heir. His queen was probably avoiding syphilis. All 11 of his children are buried without crowns. His brother inherits the throne and the family business of selling Africans into generational bondage. They continue to tax England and every colony under the empire. Did you know that DNA doesn't make family? just some biochemical cake, matter of, cake batter of relations. Deoxyroboronucleic robo acid is a scientific name for DNA. It's a polymer, a connective material, something that holds. Pages and books are bound with polymers. Is DNA something sweet and electric like static and wool? Thinking on DNA, I question, how do you hold on to the legacies of the past without inheriting the hell of your ancestors? And how are clawed and legged creatures grown in soft-shelled eggs shaped like the sun? I am getting to know my ancestors when Aunt Gurley twists her face into a frown, saying they didn't give them a cent for discovering crystal caves. In school, my Aunt Gurley learns two sentences about Juan de Bermudez and Christopher Columbus. Discovery is worth a mention but occupation is worth a fortune. My aunt girly smacks her teeth, and I know she is done speak, speaking on crystal caves and lost fortunes. My aunt girly goes into the next of what she wants me to know. She tells me she is the baby of 12 children and named for her grandmother, Ida. Ida, 
This is the first time I've heard the name Ida. This is the first time I've heard Aunt Gurley's given name. Ida swims behind my eyes and starts to flood my ears. My Aunt Gurley is the baby girl named for an ancestor, my great-great-grandmother, Ida. Ida means a hard worker. Great-great-grandma Ida's mother, my third great-grandmother, Aunt Gurley's great-grandmother, died during childbirth and was thrown overboard. I erupt in terror. It is lava in my DNA. I ask. She died in childbirth and was thrown off the ship. My Aunt Gurley says, yes, she died during childbirth and was thrown overboard. My living ancestors to the left and the right of my Aunt Gurley nod yes. I ask, where was she coming from? My Aunt Gurley answers that my third great grandma, whose name we do not know, was coming from Africa on a ship where she died birthing my great great grandma Ida and was thrown overboard. At first, I do not believe her. I try to dismiss her story. I think because I read books, I can know all things about slavery and the afterlives. I look past the screen into my Aunt Gurley's eyes and I subconsciously span lifetimes. I immediately understand that I'm an expensively educated fool, a jester in line amid a courtier's offering rehearsed praises for empires that attempt to erase my existence. I am parading around court wearing a book written by my conquerors like a crown of bells. And I can use my tongue to make a mock scepter in order to save my own neck. Empire histories without chronological proximity are a series of opaque equations and unknowable answers. Empire histories are skill-based drills for automatic answers that make learning a sequence of rapid dates. Empire histories are stories of improbable impossibilities that have manufactured documents in their image to serve as evidence for improbable and incomplete accounts. What about the evidence of the body as an archive, of war and resistance, our generation's evidence? These questions are ringing off my head, chasing uncomfortable chuckles as a gesture my tongue fences against my pen. The truth is what I choke on like a sword. It is my story and the blood in my mouth. History has been drilled into me. Empire has been drilled into me. He wants me to remember the arts of domination and call the brief recesses of his occupation an amazing grace. Slave trading was abolished in Britain around 1807, the British colonies, 1834. The word, the, in the world of Bermuda, uh, they know in 1808, and the slaves are finally freed in 1834. And in the postnatal American international slave trade that ends legally in 1820, but the domestic slave trade continues nefariously until 1865, and there are tales and evidence thereof that the slave trade continued. I am thinking about all of these contradictions in the calculated possibilities of undocumented histories in the context of forced documentation and the forced erasures of my family. I try to convince myself that my Aunt Gurley's truths are unlikely. Her story would mean that my great-great-grandmother would have been born around 1857. This truth destabilizes the origin mythologies that are the polymer settled into our democracy and collective existence. These imperial mythologies stick so close to me that my first instinct is to deny what my Aunt Gurley shared with me is possible. The reinforcement of these mythologies blinds me to the fact that my great aunt my grandmother's sister, she who loves her sister and therefore loves me, is confused. Or worse, I convince myself that she is an unsuspecting liar. This is not true. My Aunt Gurley is not a liar. She is enlightened and has ascended beyond the limits of imperial fabrications. She has survived the empire because her grandmother survived empire. Her great-grandmother, my third great-grandmother, did not survive. My double consciousness is crisscrossed and confused.
There are tales and evidence of the yachts, small sailing vessels, and cargo ships that continued to operate in the slave trade carrying Africans and free blacks as contraband. Ships like the Amistad, the Charming Sally, the Wanderer, the Clotilda, and all the others that were not arrested and successfully smuggled Africans into the Americas after the international slave trade was abolished. Right now, in 2024, there is a threat and probability that in this very instance, there is a girl, a child, is being stolen from her mother, thrown in some box in the bottom of a ship, transported halfway across the world before she is thrown in a dungeon of a bedroom or a kitchen or a spa and nail salon or grand, ground service or dance hall or construction site or meat packing plant or daycare to work to undercut living wages in a market economy, to cheat the system and the law. These girls, excuse me, they tell these girls that their pay is for their transport and an opportunity at a new life. I am so educated that I am delusional about these illegal probabilities of the transatlantic slave trade and dismiss the possibility of an illegally traded slave ship in my third great grandmother's life and in my DNA. I act as if undocumented ships aren't docking in the ports of America right now and if these ships aren't full of people from the corners of the world. My third great grandmother, mother to my great grandmother Ida, died while giving birth. They tossed her body overboard. I am knowing this because my Aunt Gurley knows this. Did I tell you that I can find myself lost in the possibilities of science in a story? I drift off, I go overboard. I am centuries away, past and futures all at the same time. I am thinking on how the DNA of Africans pushed overboard during the transatlantic slave trade must have changed the chemical composition of the Atlantic Ocean. I wonder what the blood quantum of the Atlantic sea water is. And I wonder what is at rest in the restless ocean and what portions of the ocean are remnants of African bodies that continue to evaporate in the water cycle and give us rain. African DNA may be the unarticulated property in the atmosphere, held in the clouds. Have my ancestors continuously been raining on me? What portion of African DNA may be held in the dark matter of this in the quantum universes. And when I get time away from work, I will work on building such a theory to answer these questions about Africans and the ways that we have altered the atmospheres. I will create a, an equation to quantify this and other hypotheses. But for right now, the rent is due and I need to figure out how to stay free and survive this capitalist environment. <laughs> I don't have time to figure out that theory today. <laughs> I prayed to know my ancestors. My Aunt Gurley, my great aunt Ida, tells me that my third great grandma died birthing in Ida and they tossed her overboard. I remember it in my DNA. The protein product of stress, I'm sorry, the protein product of stress in the genetic code is called CRHR1, corticotropin, releasing hormone receptor one. This is the stress gene in the human DNA sequences. I feel cortisol glowing inside of me. My arm hairs begin to stiffen like micro machetes, leaving what looks like moth holes in my sweater sleeves. I close my eyes and pick through the holes. I see a pregnant and vibrant ancestor grandmother, pregnant as a young wife, captured and taken to a ship. I hear men saying she ain't even that big and that she can't last, and that she can last a two month trip. Or was it a week? Imperial history tell, tends to be a highlights reel. The actions of ambitious men and women are fodder of legacies. It is near 1865 and my third great-grandmother is in labor. Slavery is illegal in England, 
International, the international slave trade is illegal in the United States. Only domestic slave trades are permissible. America is engaging in a civil war, and slavery has been abolished. The institution of slavery is the polymer holding together the new Confederacy, formerly the Southern States of America. Night after night, hundreds of souls of Confederate soldiers are jumping into glass bottles on Southern trees. The, flight, the fight is nearly over. Those sympathetic to the Confederate cause are reading the details in the eyes of the Haints. Since 1862, the Globe Hotel in St. George's, Bermuda is a Confederate headquarters for blockade operations in the Atlantic Ocean. A Confederate sympathizer and his wife hosted Confederate officers in their colonial mansion, including the commander, Major Norman S. Walker, and his wife, Georgiana, with her cascading black curls. Major Norman S. Walker's headquarters are about five miles from Bailey's Bay in Hamilton, Bermuda, where my family members live. Today, the Globe Hotel is now the Rogues and Runners Museum. It is now a tomb detailing Confederate blockade runners in their glory days. On June 4th, 1993, the Daughters of the Confederacy celebrate the museum with an official proclamation that reaffirms the constant connection and friendship with Bermuda and Bermudians for their memorable care and help in times of trial and crisis. In addition to quick ships and slaves, the Confederates in Bermuda have community. Do you know the, the Code of Black Girl Communities and her tributaries? Tony K. Bambara, Bambara reminds me that if your friends don't know it, then you don't know it, and if you don't know that, then you don't know nothing. Bambara continues by asking me, what else are you pretending to know today, colored girl? And I am telling you this because in black girl communities, we share what we know. And what I know is the first spirit of the grandmother. She comes through the body of the second spirit, who is the mother. The first spirit is reincarnated in the body of the daughter. The spirit of the daughter is not the third spirit. She is the first spirit. Gammy cells don't divide, they fold into each other. The gamete becomes a zygote and carries with it the code of the grandmother. Since the mother is born with the first spirit's egg cells, she carries the first spirit's code. The mother never gets the first spirit's code. The daughter gets the code. It is a type of direct transfer from the grandmother to the granddaughter. Is this the reason why I instantly smell my grandmother as I am searching for her great-grandmother in my work? The smell of her perfume powder seems to be coiling in the steam of my cup. Our sense of smell is keenly connected to memory. I sip the hot water and my grandmother's kisses are in my nostrils. I prayed to know my ancestors and was forced to negotiate with history along the way. Where in the ocean did my ancestor anchor? Was my third great-grandmother tossed overboard on a journey across the Atlantic or on a week's journey between Alexandria, Virginia and the slave markets of Charleston, South Carolina? In my nightmares, I hear men whispering that they will get more money for the black body in this life and the black body that is to come. I see my third grand, great-grandmother under deck praying her child isn't born in bondage. I hear her calling out. No one is sure if she was, is responding to the swells of the boat or birth. Her feet are still shackled at the ankles. Her hands still shackled above the bulge of her belly. The only thing between the flesh of her back and the boat are greater contractions. Is prayer in my DNA? Is it the polymer, the connective tissue between the human and the divine? My third great-grandmother prays until change is on the horizon. Someone warns a hurricane is headed straight for the ship's bow. Imperial history has not promised to care for me. In chattel slave systems, the child follows the condition of the mother. 
It is 1835, 15 years after the United States closes the African transatlantic slave trade. The Enterprise, the Brig, sets out for a week's voyage from Alexandria, Virginia to Charleston, South Carolina. The ship is engaged in the domestic slave trade and is carrying 78 black slaves in addition to cargo. Maybe my third great grandma was on a ship like this one. She was a free and pregnant woman who chose a husband or a wife or embraced several lovers, knowing that the luxuries like pleasure, like joy, like all other things in America must be cultivated. She is a polymer, a mother and an ancestor, in all moments at once bridging life and death, the past with the futures. Can you see what I know? My third great grandma with her bound wrists extended to God, she is praying for an intercession, a shift. If she were on a ship like the Enterprise that illegally, illegally trafficked Africans and free blacks into slavery, the gods would answer with winds of a hurricane. The ship would have been tossed off course and the Captain Smith, not the one from the 17th century that knows Pocahontas, but the one from the 19th would refuse and would, would refuse but seek provision in Hamilton, Bermuda. In the eyes of the hurricane, my great grandma prayed for her unborn. My third great grandma prayed for her unborn, marked as Cain to be free. The lightning cracked, the wind rung, and every, everyone's ear like a siren goddess. The divine answered, my third great grandma is smited during birth of her daughter, offering the wind any treasure for interceding on her behalf. After third great grandma births her daughter Ida, she is thrown overboard. I can imagine her body being taken up like Elijah, the goddess of the wind, planting her directly at heaven's doorstep. This is the story they tell her daughter, my great great grandma Ida. Those that don't tell her whisper about it. There's a technology of pictures. I use it to frame my ancestors and it is how I know that I look like my mother. And I know that my mother look like, looks like Whitney Houston's mother and Whitney Houston and I don't look anything alike. <laughs> Genes are funny things. Family is a chronic construction. Some DNA software reads my genetic history like my phone is a crystal ball. My unassigned DNA is listed as probably from Bermuda or Turks and Caicos. They are all in my business, like all up under the upholstery, like an unwanted dust mite or a much feared bed lice. They say my mitochondria DNA results are one in 1,200 in their database. They want permission to tell the world. History is inclined to forget me and the facts about the enterprise, but I can tell you that the captains of the enterprise didn't know when they were capturing Africans and free blacks from Maryland that some Africans can fly. Captain Smith and them didn't know that some can walk right out to the sea and in view of their slavers and on the nose of flying fish. Some Africans can take to the air and go right back home to Africa or to heaven based on their preference. <laughs> Compared to bondage for some Africans, some free blacks, it's the same difference. My third great grandma would not have been on the manifest, dead or alive. They named her surviving daughter Ida, meaning hard working. And Ida's mo mother, mother name, I'm sorry, and Ida's mother's name is unknown. I will name her Holy because she is the one who took to the air like a woman connected to the divine might do. During her ascent, I can hear her laughing, hear, hear her heart-shaped mouth glittering, her eyes like crystal caverns, the curvatures of her body 
echoing DNA, forming round shapes, wheels within wheels. Wherever the spirit would go, they would go, and the wheels would rise along with them because the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. When the creatures moved, they also moved. When the creatures stood still, they also stood still. And when the creatures rose from the ground, the wheels rose along with them because the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. And if we can take them now. Okay. So how do I use this to hit or can you guys do it from there? Chime, chime my music. <laughs> oh, do I just need to use this? Okay. I am Morgan made, and this is the Morgan State University uh, choir. And if you don't know, they're a little bit better than Fisk. <laughs> Oh, that's wonderful. It was just brilliant. Thanks. And I love the way you moved around to uh, counting the generations, saying, no, no, it couldn't have happened with the transatlantic slave trade, unless you know, it was one of the illegal ships. Um, and then saying, yes, but there was the domestic slave trade, which moved, removed one million uh, enslaved African Americans from the Upper South to the Lower South between roughly 1830 to 1860 uh, because of the removal of the Native Americans and the Trail of Tears, the growth of cotton, stuff that you, uh, that you know already. Um. The sugar industry didn't disappear, it's capitalism, it just moved 50 miles. Mm -hmm. to Cuba, and Cuba ends up with 970,000 um, Africans shipped from the continent after 1804. I mean, it's, it's astonishing. Two and a half times the number that we got. 
mm -hmm. uh, here in the United States. So that's another possibility too. But it's just um, beautiful. Thank you. Um, what you've done. Congratulations. It's, thank you. I don't know what else to say. It's great. Oh, thank you. Know? you. And you know a lot about DNA. That's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> But you do look a little like Whitney Houston to me. I don't know. <laughs> Thanks. Questions, comments? Yes. Um, first, let me just say wow. wow. Thank you. Uh, I'm just so lifted and compelled. And thank you for that beautiful articulation cool. that you gave us. That was a gift this afternoon. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a comment and a question, and I'll be very fast. Um, my comment is that what is most compelling to me is that this seems like uh, a lesson, a warning, uh, perhaps maybe a reminder that we should believe uh, when our families tell us things. I've been in this situation where um, maybe it was too hard for me to conceptualize that what I was being told could actually be true. But I think if we give ourselves permission to go there, as you have shown us, that we'll find um, something that's really interesting and um, a, a monument to those who have come before us. Uh, my question is about your methodology. <laughs> um, historians, uh, I think, wish that we could articulate uh, as beautifully as you have done. Um, but we have, you know, our own kind of methodology and language that we stick to quite often. Mm -hmm. And so talk about how you marry the two, history and literature, um, in the work that you do for this particular one and um, in, your, in your work, in your poetry volumes. Um, I also want a pre-copy of the book. Go ahead and put it in <laughs> for Blood Bible. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks, Alexandra. Um, so number one... I have never ever been good at coloring in the lines. I was always very interested in history, but I did abandon history. Um, you know, I changed my major about five times at Morgan State University. And English was definitely, um, I came back to English twice, but um, history was definitely one of the majors that I was interested in, but the methods always seemed to limit. I was interested in the human story not the empire story, which is really coming out in the drafts of these books, right? I was very interested in the human story. And so English allowed that. So let's be very clear. I was not confident enough to call myself a writer at the time or even see myself as a writer because um, as many of you know, I was, I was the mother of an infant and a toddler at the time. And I did not see any... Um, way to exist in a capitalist empire and be a writer as a single mother. Um, and my, you know, my parents had warned me since I was very young, which will come out in, in the uh, memoir, that artists die poor. So, um, that what? artists die poor. Oh, right. Yeah, they continuously <laughs> warn me that artists die poor and, 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 and send me to engineering camps. That's what they do. Artists die poor, go to this camp. Um, and camp. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, um, I always, I, I can't abandon it because it's kind of like, um, in, in a very sick way, it's, it's a type of ovum, right? It's a type of environment that in order to be liberated, I have to challenge that environment and everything that I do and every question of the day, right? Not, 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 you know, aggressively challenged, but rethink it, you know? If I'm going to embrace liberation as an individual um, commitment. Thank you. This was great. I mean, um, my first book starts with my grandma. Actually, the, the plot is she's caressing me, and that's how the story of, of, of my book begins, and I was very moved. Um, and... And the way you framed rain uh, and ocean with the connection to ancestors, I mean, I don't think I'll be able to look at rain in a, mm -hmm. as it's powerful, very well done on that part. To really uh, bring that uh, so natural a thing, but so much of it. Since yeah. this is being taped, copyright to Mayor Sill. Go ahead. <laughs> 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 the YouTubes are everywhere. Yeah, you have to be careful on that one. 
Uh, but <laughs> but I, I think um, then you know you talk about s DNAs and, and cells and tissues and, and you know this kind of investment into. I've never thought of thinking about ancestry with that aspect of so much, of so to say, uh, breaking down, and and making it uh, plausible to the imagination of what ancestry means. And uh, clearly, there is, I mean, you know, great grandmother, and, and there mm -hmm. is a grand, there's a grand tradition of the grandparents, mm -hmm. and slavery and uh, um, colonization mediates strongly in that. And these are two really important vectors of looking at the world. But I wondered if you could also think of it otherwise, not to mean you have to discount it, mm -hmm. but to look it into an original imagination of something. Uh, I mean, these, these two important events change the course of history, certainly. Absolutely. Uh, but also, how do we look at our heritage in a sense uh, that is certainly mediated by this, but also not? Is there something that exists autonomously? I mean, I think that's the question I'm asking, right? Like, how do we look back to the past and not carry ourselves with the overburdens of, of what our ancestors have already um, transgressed us to this space from, right? And that's just something I'm still wrestling with, right? I'm very interested in becomings. I always have been. I think that's my obsession with becomings becoming? yeah like origins and becomings right and i think i i i think the imperial answer is that the identity of a child is separate from the identity of an adult hmm. what i believe is that all of the strategies that you learn as a child become a bank of intellectual negotiation power as you become an adult hmm. So I'm very interested in those transitions, right? I'm very interested in how girlhood and childhood and the things that we learn in the home um, and in those experience, trial and error, positive or negative, inform how we negotiate the world. So I don't know the answer is what mm. I'm saying to you. I'm trying to figure no, it I out. I think it's brilliant. Not knowing is brilliant because this, <laughs> this remains to be explored. So the question was connecting. My question actually was about, you talk about yourself as an educated person, but also, you know, in a way, there's this self-mockery. I'm too mm -hmm. smart and too, uh, you know, I, if you could just talk through your personal, like, why did that come to you? Were you too educated for people around you or was it in your community or were people no. who looked at you as, hey, you're acting too smart or something like that? Just mm -mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -mm. It's, it's deeper than that. Mm. It's philosophically deeper than that. Mm. There is not one pathway to the truth. I refuse to lead, believe that there is only one pathway of intellectual knowledge. I refuse to believe it because I know the world existed before the transatlantic slave trade. I know the world existed before capitalism and I will not s only be informed by that because I already know that that structure as a black woman may not make my journey easy. In that structure as a black woman, I'm expected to carry multiple people across the transition of a capitalist landscape and not ask for money and live and sustain on praise and thank yous. I don't intend to do that. I don't intend to do that. I do, I do. <laughs> So, <laughs> All so I got to figure it out. <laughs> I think it's disgusting. <laughs> so, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. yes. uh, um, that was breathtaking, as expected. Um, and my question is really, in some sense, it's, it's sort of a mirror and a follow up. Um, I actually think part of what you do is a really strong critique of historical methodologies. Um, that uh, the presumption that certain kinds of documentation, you, you disrupt that by demonstrating that there's a, there's a set of investments, right, to narrating 
an empire in a particular way, then the documentation is as partial and fragmented as anything else. And then you suggest that we actually begin with, a, with evidence differently, right? So that this, this story functions as a kind of evidence and then you follow the discovery as opposed to beginning with the, docu yes, the imperial documentation. that is totally documentation. my methodology. And I think that that's really powerful and I think it actually can has legs to move in multiple arenas. I also think there's something really um, uh, powerful in what you, and you always do this beautiful work of observation, right, wherever you go, and you, I mean, I've seen, I've been with you, right, you, you are observing every environment that you're in and doing these complex readings, and when you, you, but you do it with the body here and look for the, the kind of, I don't know what the right language is, but like, it's not metaphor, but the structural analogy between the form of the body right, and the environment, and, and suggest a different way of thinking about the relationship between physicality and spirit. And so I think, so my, my question, I guess, is to ask you to talk about that, but I also think that there's real power in claiming that as, as that kind of intervention that you're making mm -hmm. um, boldly. I don't have an answer. <laughs> <laughs> but that is true. That is I. That is my my methodology. And maybe um, okay. I'm just I'm just gonna say it, and it might not come out um, glamorous or pretty or highly intellectual. But I have a brain that's really really good at patterns and at categories. Um, and this is documented in multiple professional spaces. Um. And, and I may have inherited from my paternal grandfather who has very similar skills as I have, as the US military has documented. Um, and it comes out in, in, in every space that I'm in, but it's also a kind of play, right? Like I'm, I think that's also why I'm very interested in play. I'm interested in putting things together. I'm interested in seeing how things will go together. I'm interested in observing the result, the becoming of a goal. And so when I go in places, I do analyze it in those ways, both on a rational level and a surrealist level. And I'm probably better at the surrealist because, you know, life is chaotic anyway. <laughs> Getting it to make sense is hard. That's, that's all. I don't know what else I can say about that. If I may continue on Imani's point, first and foremost, you're a poet. And I think Plato would be screaming right now, right? Because he's showing <laughs> um, the power of poetry. And I, and I think very much the metaphor is the glue in terms of the polymer and everything else. And the, the becoming and unknowing is the starting point of the poem not knowing where the poem will take you and you're shaping it to the metaphors, mm -hmm. then you get to the consciousness in terms of the finished product. Mm -hmm. and, and I think perhaps that's the methodology of the poet, of a good poet. And I think what you're giving us here is that poetry mm -hmm. through the historical and scientific lens. Mm -hmm. Thank you. you know, again, I guess for mm -hmm. us poets, I would say that's why we, poets, we are so good, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with that. I agree. Okay. Thank you. Um, just one fact mm -hmm. for your beautiful metaphor of the, the African DNA and the Atlantic Ocean that we know, these are all, of course, estimates, but they're very sophisticated estimates from the Transatlantic Slave Trade Database. We know that 12.5 million Africans embarked and 10.7 million disembarked. So that's almost two million people at the bottom of the ocean from the best scientifically, you know, big database that, that we have. That's a lot of, that's a lot of DNA. But I'm struck, I'm glad Sadia is here. I'm, I'm struck and I've been thinking about this the last few years and um, talked to my students about it. That when they write the intellectual period of our history, they'll look back and see within broadly construed African, African-American studies, and Afro-Latin American studies, so see Jorge back there. Um, <laughs> two streams, very strong and solid, emerging at the same time. 
I, I think that all sort of speculative history or whatever words that you might want to call it in our field are the children of um, um, Sadia Hartman, <laughs> you know, scenes of subjection. Mm -hmm. And so that's one stream. Then the other is the fact that the digital revolution has made archival research easier. You know, mm -hmm. it used to be you, you'd have to take years and years and years and have a lot of money just to do what you could do sitting in your desk up, upstairs. Um, and we've, when you compare this presentation with Greg um, Hekimovich's mm -hmm. presentation, and Sadia, he's the guy who spent 20 years trying to prove me wrong on <laughs> Hannah yeah, Crafts yeah. to prove me right. Ta da! <laughs> <laughs> um, that's amazing. So, and I want, you know, as mm -hmm. a, an administrator, let's say, I'm, and as a person who has graduate students, mm -hmm. I want to encourage both streams. Yes. That don't give up on the archive. The archives are more open. You know, it used to be we would say, oh, there is no record. You know, so forget it. Well, there is a record. Mm -hmm. Not a record for everything, but there's a record for a lot more than we ever dreamed 20 years ago. Absolutely. But on the other hand, sophisticated speculation, poetic um, renderings, based on fact and, you know, as conditioned as reasonably possible by um, what we know, um, is a beautiful contribution too. But both things are mm -hmm. going on at, at, at the same time and, and we have to do our best to, um, to encourage them, I think. Would you agree? Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I, I would agree and I would Can we pass this to, it's just for the recording. Um, I would agree and I would say even when there's archival plentitude, that doesn't mean that there's not as much speculative no labor required. Definitely. So I think it's right not to make dearth into something that's absolute. Um, but now that I have the mic, I want to ask you a question. And, and I mean, um, I too, I mean, I really appreciated the talk. I thought it was so lovely. I find myself wanting to actually see the lines on the page, because I wanted to ask you about narrative and lyric mm -hmm. in the work, and how, you know, what that balance is for you, and really thinking about compositional practice. Okay. Um, anybody that truly knows me knows that I am obsessive about revision. Obsessive about revision. Obsessive about revision. <laughs> this, this talk was probably done last week and I spent four hours doing stuff this morning. Um, so the first thing, you know, you, you have to keep asking questions in every iteration. And I was sitting at dinner about 10 days ago with some very lovely people that asked me how my work was going. <laughs> And I was like, oh, I wrote this chapter. It's like 90% there, but it's not there. I was like, I have to rewrite it. It's not there. I have to rewrite it. And I, and I wanted to rewrite it because most of this was written in like what I call like a collage narrative, so like a series of vignettes mm -hmm. that were going kind of in a chronological order but it didn't encapsulate the experience of the environment and it didn't um, give credence to the external forces that were influencing what was happening internally. So I went back to some straft, some, 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 some um, craft strategies and um, the structure of this portion of the chapter, because it's, it's, it's only, um, the chapter is, is larger and has more in it. I don't know if it's gonna make it to the book, but we'll see. Um, but I had to uh, change it using a craft strategy called a braided essay so I could collapse time. I'm not interested in linear time at all because I'm interested in the becomings and how they influence the punctuated time. 
So I'm interested in things like dark matter. I'm interested in things like quantum physics and how they appear in narrative storytelling. And so I had to change the craft of the essay to what uh, we call in prose writing a braided essay where you take three seemingly unrelated topics and at the end of the braid they become related. But I had to continue to improvise and revise on the strategy because I had to turn the braid into a hurricane. Right? And then I also had to think about you guys and how much tension you could take. Right? And so there were punctuations of like reprieve and breath, right? But I had to bring you back in that hurricane to symbolize what my great great grandmother was born into. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to echo what everyone else has said. Damaris, that, that, that was great. Um, yeah, I'm not going to attempt to even define your methodology. <laughs> I think it was too difficult. But it struck me that you're interested in the kind of messinesses of history uh, and the kind of unexpected. And I was struck by, at one point, quite near the beginning, you talked about Britain as a kind of outpost of the Roman Empire, right? Uh-huh. Uh, in which... <laughs> What I thought was interesting <laughs> there is, is that you're moving beyond the kind of expected 400, last 400 years of history, 500 now, of white, black, uh, kind of, you know, Europeans enslaving those of, of darker skin to Europeans enslaving Europeans. And I don't know whether you had this in mind, but um, I remember, like, maybe rereading Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad, and right near the beginning, he talks that. about the, the British as, as kind of serfs or slaves, I can't quite remember the term he uses mm -hmm. of, he does, right, of the Roman Empire. And it, it's such a striking, on this reread, it really hit me. And I don't know if, if you were thinking about that at all, but it, it's just, it strikes me that you're doing very interesting things in terms of deliberately picking away at these expected norms of, you know, the things that we think we know and actually mm -hmm. kind of going, actually, it's more messy, it's more entangled or something. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, this is kind of a comment. I don't know if it's... Right. So what if, what if, like questions I would ask myself with that, is what if the Roman Empire has Stockholm Syndrome? What if we start talking about the American empires having Stockholm Syndrome? Right? What, what do you, explain what you mean. I mean, someone who is captured and is taken against their will and then fall adopt... In love with your yeah, fall in love with your oppressor and adopt the ideologies of your oppressor as truth, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I didn't want to say it, you know. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Right. I'm not grown enough to say that right here at Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 like, not get a file, right? <laughs> not get an FBI file. But, you know, thank you for saying that, though, right? So that's exactly what I'm speaking about. Um, and so I am definitely um, interested in picking at the messiness. Now, I wasn't thinking about Heart of Darkness, but what I do believe, what I know is that I was educated at Morgan State University in Maryland, Morgan made. Um, but I have also, you know, where I had a very good British literature teacher, Dr. Ruth Sheffy. And I have read, she's great, right? Oh, that's great. Yeah, she's really great. Yeah. Um, and um, I did read Heart of Darkness, but I don't know if I consciously tapped into that reserve but, you know, I'm an artist and I'm a human being, so everything that touches me changes me, right? Mm -hmm. So it was probably present in that way. Just one quick footnote about Ezekiel 37. That's also, son of man, can these bones live? And mm -hmm. that is, the, I keep that as a motto for our DNA work of finding your roots. And David Reich's brother, who I think mm -hmm. is a rabbi, sent him that almost at the same time. Oh. Because it is a metaphor for um, the resurrection mm. of ancestry through a DNA analysis. Yes. And for the, all of you unchristians, <laughs> uh, this is in the book of the Bible, <laughs> book of Ezekiel, chapter 37, verses 1 to, uh, I'm making this 37 up. 37. <laughs> Well, 1 to 14 is Ezekiel saw the wheel. Yeah. And then son of man can these bones live. It, it's such a beautiful 
the way that our ancestors took the Hebrew Bible mm -hmm. and then reformed it into poetry it is one of uh, one of the truly great moments uh, mm -hmm. in the history of uh, the world of literature. You know, James mm -hmm. Weldon Johnson's old black and unknown bards. These guys were geniuses. Mm -hmm. These men and women were geniuses who did that. So. Mm -hmm. And with with that said, some some of you know, but some of you don't know. Everyone in my family is a pastor. Everyone in my family is like an an AME pastor. So I think my first introduction to word and story and metaphor was definitely in church. And and the arts for that sake. That's great. Perfect segue into my question. Um, I have two, they're very quick. First is if you could tell us a little bit, if you are open to it, um, how you came to this title, Blood Bible. It sounds like you started to get there just now. Um, mm -hmm. And the second question is a little more personal. If you'd be open to teaching a writer's workshop this semester, <laughs> but those of us that are not quite at this level. <laughs> uh, yes to the workshop, now that my presentation is done, <laughs> right? Um, but yeah, I'm, uh, I am an ancestor of, of a physical legacy and of a spiritual legacy. So I'm thinking about that with blood and Bible. And I'm also thinking about how the Bible was co-opted uh, in, in um, environments and systems of, of chattel slavery. To oppress us. To oppress us. But the AME church is all about, like, liberated Bible. Like, we're, we're like, you know, dare I say, don't, don't say nothing to people out here because I know my family is watching. <laughs> we, we're really not that religious. We're, we're pretty ethical, though. Right? And so um, in the time and in the churches that I grew up in, the Bible was there, but it was always an interpretive text that related to life. Um, and it was like being a good steward is not being religiously pious in my denomination. It's being a steward of your community. And so those are things that I continue to value. You're welcome. Figurative language, mm -hmm. rather than literal readings of the Bible. Absolutely. Yeah. Damaris, I wonder if you can talk a little bit, even being in the space of hearing and being acted upon by the, the language and thinking, the leaps um, and the momentum. And it's more than that. It's like every time you made one of those leaps, my spirit just got big and it held on to something that it, it, I think it continues to hold. And so the momentum that you create, you know, moving to that storm, um, it doesn't go away. You're still <coughs> writing this book. Mm -hmm. And so I'd love to hear you talk about, because I also know you are deep in archives. Um, can you talk about what the power that you're building is authorizing you to do in and to those archives? Does that make sense? How are you um, changed by what you're writing? And how is that leading you with the different or other authorities into the research that you're still doing? I'm, I'm, uh, thank you for that, Tracy. I'm just going to say it. Yeah, th this is poet, 22nd Poet Laureate of the United States. <laughs> the poet of, of all the poets um, in the United States. Um, so Tracy, I am, I am, I'm, I'm unsure. It's, it's kind of an exploratory process. I answer when I get there, when I survey the environment. Um, right now, I'm working on revising individual chapters, and so the four chapters that are related to genealogy in my memoir, I am going to write a separate book about the family histories, for real, for sure. Hopefully, it will not take me the rest of my life. But yes, I am going to write a more complete. But what I wanted to do is right now in the memoir, I'm writing kind of chronologically. But as I begin to write about family is where I'm disrupting time. And so in disrupting time, each of these chapters must disrupt structure. And so I write the story in pretty much like um, Imani said, the, the, the archival information comes in as a type of affirmation. And if I need to revise after that, then I, then I set about that work. Yeah. 
Mine is very simple. Um, how did you get the courage to, to be who you are in your art form and just be, I guess? I'm scared all the time. What are you talking about? <laughs> I'm scared right now. I'm afraid and anxious right now. And then I just accept it's a part of the process and be about the business of the work. So it's, <laughs> it's not it's not done, it's not finished. Like in, in my mind, it was supposed to be done already. I'm supposed to only be prettying it up. So every day that I'm spending drafting, I'm not making it pretty. So you can say there's a force that kind of just keeps pushing you. Yeah, stubbornness, um, anxiety, frustration, um, you know, curiosity for knowing my ancestors, love for my ancestor. All of these are like forces, like, you know, the ability to understand uh, the time and space that I'm in without losing my mind. Um, the passionate drive I have not to be lied to on a regular basis. You know, those are things that want to, like none of it is like, I'm, I'm sorry if I made it look easy or like made it look like it was like natural. It is so not, right now I have, I have the biggest knot in my stomach right now. You have no idea. I had to talk to Professor Gates before I read because if I would have talked to him from here, I would be crying. Like I'm just faking it. Have you not noticed I've taken off my shoes many times <laughs> to get some grounding? My feet don't hurt. I need some grounding. Yeah. You cried a little. I did. Yeah. But not here on the mic and in, and in the archive. Yeah. No, that, you teared up a little bit before came. <laughs> Keep that out, the archive. <laughs> <laughs> That is not what I do in the archive. Yeah. <laughs> I, bet, I bet Foucault teared up. Yeah. You know, do you have an insight? That's the Holy Ghost. You know, I mean, that's and you put together, and you realize, oh my God, I never thought of that before. Mm -hmm. That is such a rush. Yeah. It is. That's why, if, if you could just show students and help them find that, mm -hmm. then they would realize how desirable our, and how special our careers are. Mm -hmm. you know, even if you're you know, doomed not to you know, make what a hedge fund person, et cetera, et cetera. It is such a special calling to be a professor. I agree. And what we don't make at the hedge fund, we save in uh, heart medicine prescriptions and <laughs> hospital trips for stress. <laughs> you know. But we have our degree of craziness. In we, we, do. <laughs> we do. We do. We do. We do. We do. Hi, Tiffany. It was so amazing. So I have a, Thank you. just one sort of question about the Caribbean as space as an archipelago and sort of what that means throughout your narrative. So mm -hmm. it's there, but there's sort of multiple Souths also in your narrative based on talking to you and other um, occasions. So I'm wondering, clearly place and space are important, but yes. there's a particular... Uh, sense of physicality with the Caribbean. And so I'm wondering how much, how much more of that are you sort of teasing out with the chapter? Um, Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, not, it's, I'm not teasing out that much with the chapter. Um, specifically for this chapter, um, what really uh, is kind of what I'm thinking about as the environment is Crystal Caves. So Crystal Caves is definitely my favorite place in Bermuda. Um, when my mother was, was dying and I was visiting her over the summer, at one point she had forgotten her father's name. But when I would ask her what's her favorite place in Bermuda, she would say Crystal Caves immediately. Oh, wow. So I don't know if she knew that her uncle was instrumental in discovering the place. I didn't know until I talked to my Aunt Gurley, right? Which is like six weeks ago. But um, I, I, I try to see these caves no matter where I am, but this is by far the most beautiful, mm -hmm. right? 
And so I was like joking with a friend that's from Hawaii on the phone the other night. And she was like, oh, caves are so gross. And I was like, no, this is the one Caliban and his mother had to live in. Like, it's not gross, <laughs> right? And they do do weddings in here and you can get spa treatments in here now. You know, it's a whole thing. But, um, and it wasn't always like that. But I mean, I like to cling or try to imagine, if, if possible, beautiful environments um, because there, there's so many things I have to witness in this world that, that are not beautiful that I try to, to indulge in the luxury of beauty when I can. So I don't, I don't know how it's playing out yet. I can tell you uh, um, what, what kind of lit a fire under this project is um, when I was at Brown, I was able to go to the John Carter Brown Library and I pulled, they were able to show me a map from Bermuda from the 1640s. And um, my, one of my surnames was, was on the map. And I started thinking about being, being owned since 1640, right? In a space that was an island. Um, and started, you know, marinating on that. And, and what they also did on that map is they detailed like life forms and fauna. And so they were talking about the whales in a certain part of the island. And one of my aunts in that part of the island, um, her, her house is built next to a cliff. And so I grew up watching the whales go past that space, right? And thinking about the Anthropocene and the uh, interspecies um, life that, that we may share over generations. Right, so I do think about environment in that way, um, and I don't know how it's going to show up yet. But I've also lived lots of different places, so maybe I, I haven't meditated on the space in that specific way. But I also know that Toni Morrison teaches to write setting like a character. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, setting is character. Setting is character. Thank you for correcting me on that. Yes, that is exactly what she says. Setting is character. Yeah. Uh, I'm fine with it. I don't, is Krishna fine with it? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I see like Cesare, I mean, I see the imprints. Um, can you talk a little bit further about that? Sort of like who else is like in helping you just create this form? Yeah. I, I, I read, and then it gets lost in here, and then lost in here, and then I'm like, ah, I'm never going to finish, ah, and then uh, somehow or another, I just keep returning to the page early in the morning before my phone goes off and all of that other stuff and the life and the day comes in and the, and the um, demands of, of the day and earning come in, and I try to give it my best. And then every once in a while, the page gives back. <laughs> Does your family still own land? They do, but it's 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 um that's like a it's a it's a big thing and it's a whole thing. They don't own a lot of land right now. So Bermuda is only two miles by twenty two miles. Everywhere you stand on Bermuda, you can see water. There's no natural water source, mm -hmm. and so the part of the island that my family lives on now, let me go back to the island, is down here. So this is the airport. We live down here. Right. It has the most amazing water collection system in the world. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And very safe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The rain comes from, from, it just comes from the sky, naturally. Um, <laughs> and it falls on top of the white r roofs. And these are limestones, and it kind of cures the water. And then we have a tank in the bottom of the house that holds anywhere from 300 to 500 gallons of water. Each of those lines in the pyramid in the yeah. structure is an irrigation ditch. It's amazing. Yeah. The first time I went, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. Yeah. And we have sand the color of the people. We have, like, yellow, white, pink, and black. Yeah. Yeah, all over. And you have bonefish. Yes, we do. <laughs> and snapper. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. 
Thank you all. Wow. Uh, <sighs> Thank you so much. Thank you.